It's time for another episode of Let's Talk Business South Carolina, featuring industry outlooks, panel discussions on trending topics, and interviews with business executives, community leaders, and government officials. And now, coming to you from the Drum Creative Studio, here's your host, longtime South Carolina business publisher, Rick Jenkins. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Business South Carolina. This is episode number 27. I'm your host, Rick Jenkins, and as always, we are coming to you from the Drum Creative Studios. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Greenville Technical College. On this show, we often talk a lot about workforce development issues, labor shortages, and the skills gap, and there is not an educational institution that does more to address those issues than Greenville Tech. They churn out students ready to work in our advanced manufacturing facilities, they put nurses to work in our hospitals, and provide plenty of continuing education opportunities for professionals who are already in the workplace. They've been doing their thing since 1962, and I'm thrilled that they're partnering with us to produce great content for business executives. It's the beginning of February, and if you went out to your mailbox recently and found your 2023 W-2, you know what that means. It's about time to do your taxes. And if you are a business owner or an executive with financial responsibilities at work, Well, you also have to be aware of the latest tax reform news and updated IRS guidance information, which, let's face it, can sometimes be overwhelming. Joining the show today is someone who can help get you up to speed. John Price is a CPA with more than 35 years of taxation experience. He is the managing member at Scott & Company CPAs and specializes in corporate income taxation to businesses of all sizes as well as nonprofit organizations. But before we get to John, I have someone else I want you to meet. His name is Ray Lattimore, and Ray is most definitely an executive that you should know. He's been a mover and shaker in the South Carolina business community for years. Check out this brief Q&A session I had with Ray recently right here in our studio. And when we come back in just a couple of minutes, we will talk with our tax expert, John Price. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Business. And as uh, uh, as you might know by now, this is a segment we do from time to time called uh, An Executive You Should Know. And I really enjoy doing this because, one, I get to meet new folks. But, two, every now and then I get to catch up with an old acquaintance that I haven't seen in a while. And that is the case today because I'm talking to Ray Lattimore. Ray is the founder and the CEO of Marketplace Professional Staffing. And, Ray, I have not seen you since pre-COVID. How are you? I'm doing absolutely fantastic. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm glad you're here. And uh, this is just a little brief segment we do so our viewers can get to know somebody new. And I am glad that you are here with us today. So let's just start off, Ray. Where are you from? Are you a South Carolina boy? I'm a Greenville boy. You're a Greenville boy, man. You Born and raised, right? Born and raised. Greenville. In a little place called Nickeltown. Nickeltown. I am quite familiar with it. You founded Marketplace Professional Staffing in what year? We're looking uh, about 20 Not, years ago. Yeah, about 27 years 27 ago. 27 years ago. What made you decide to do that? Well, I graduated from college on a basketball scholarship and picked up a business degree and went to work for a large corporation called MetLife. Yep. Traveled all over the country. Right. Spent four years in Manhattan and was ready to come home. All right. And Excuse me, but you said a couple things there that I can't let pass. One, a basketball scholarship. Where'd you play ball, man? I uh, played basketball at Spinebird Methodist for two years and Southern Wesleyan for two more. How about that? Well, I'm from, I'm from Kentucky, so I'm, a, of course, a huge basketball <laughs> fan. And then you went and you lived in New York City. Did you live in Manhattan? I lived in Manhattan. You lived in Manhattan, which is one of my favorite places in the world. It's a love it, hate it kind of place, but you liked it? I enjoyed it for four years. I yeah, was yeah. ready to come home. Yeah, I bet you were. So you came home, and you decided, I'm going to do my own thing. Yes. And you started Marketplace. Tell me about the agency. Uh, Marketplace is 27 years old. We specialize in light industrial manufacturing, warehouse and logistics. Uh, we do HR consulting, and we do assessments of top-level executives. Well, I tell you what, if you are in the manufacturing industry or trying to appeal to that group, you couldn't find a better place to do it in South Carolina. We know a thing or two in this state about making things, don't we? We absolutely do. The best in the world. Yep. I I think you're right. Um, Was it scary, Ray, going off on your own? Not really, because the way I did it, I did it in 1996. I kept my job at MetLife. It was my dream, but I didn't want to 
you know, it's hurt my family in any kind of way. So I did both for three years. Yeah. And in 1999, when the business grew, I decided to leave MetLife at that point in time. That's smart. Now, you own a couple other businesses. Do I recall that correctly? Yes. I own a real estate investment firm where we invest in residential and commercial real estate. Have you always been entrepreneurial by nature? I knew by the time I was four or five years old that I was going to be in business at some point in time. You did? I did. You knew you were going to do your own gig? Absolutely. At but that age. How in the heck, at that age, do you know? It's just you. It was just you. That's the only thing that really caught my attention. It's the only thing I enjoyed doing other than playing basketball. I love math. I love numbers. I love to read. I love to write. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to be creative in that space and doing my own business. You started out, uh, you, you were well-educated, of course. You even mentioned a couple of places, but you started out at Greenville Tech, did you not? I did it in reverse. Um, you did it in reverse. Yes. Yeah. But you spent time at Greenville Technical College. Tell me about your time there. And Greenville Tech, of, of course, sponsors these episodes, and, and we're working together to promote uh, folks like you that, that people in the business ought to know, but that also uh, spent time at Greenville Tech. Tell me about your time. Well, there. first of all, I love Greenville Technical College. I mean, it is truly making a difference in the lives of individuals. I would suggest that the majority of the students there don't have the means to go off to college, yeah. and they attend Greenville Tech, and right. it's a real asset. Once I received my four-year degree in business administration, it was really tough to find a job in um, 2000, and it's been so long now, <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in 1982, you know, I ran into a hostage situation. Yes. And also interest rates were 20 21%. Uh, couldn't find a job, so I won a scholarship at Greenville Tech called the Minority Business Scholarship. And I went into IT, computer science, and I graduated from there in computer science and marketing and IT. With my four-year degree, I had no problem with finding a job at that point in time. Right. And, uh, if uh, again, if you're in the manufacturing industry, there's not much of a better friend than the South Carolina Technical College System, Greenville Tech included. They prepare our folks uh, to work in those facilities every day. I'm going to get you out of here on this, Ray. Uh, if you had uh, some advice to give to someone considering going into their own business, what would you say? Uh, buckle up. Yeah. It's not a sprint. It's a journey. Yeah. You're going to work 12 to 14 hours a day, but the rewards are just outstanding. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I started my own gig not too long ago, and I would say the exact th same thing. Folks, that is Ray Lattimore. Ray is the founder and the CEO of Marketplace Professional Staffing, and he is most definitely an executive you should know. Thanks to Greenville Technical College for providing this opportunity for me to talk to Ray. See you next time. Welcome back to Let's Talk Business, folks. Uh, I'm glad you're here with us today. That was a segment that we call uh, a business executive you should know. So uh, welcome back to the show, and we're going to get started here. Once again, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, brought to you today by Greenville Technical College. They have been doing business uh, here in the upstate for, uh, since 1962, and they provide a lot of continuing education opportunities for business folks. And uh, so if you are in need of such, I uh, uh, encourage you to take a look at those guys. Uh, as I mentioned, we are here today with John Price. John is uh, the managing member of the CPAs at Scott & Company. They are headquartered in Columbia, but doing business everywhere. And he is here today to talk tax strategy and get you up to speed on everything the IRS has changed for this coming year. John, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Rick. It's good to have you. You drove over from Columbia, I believe. Yes, sir, I did. I, I said that uh, you were headquartered over there. Do you have offices elsewhere? Or is no, everything comes everything comes from the Columbia office? That's now, right. Scott and Company been around for a while, right? Since 1995. Yep, been around for a while. Wow. Mm -hmm. Before we get into things, let's talk about you just for a sec. Okay. Are you a Carolina boy? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. I'm from a little town called Parksville, which is in McCormick County. Parksville. I yep. have not heard it. Now, I've only been in South Carolina for 21 years, uh, but Parksville, I have not heard. Where, where is that? That's in, it's in McCormick County. When people ask me, where's Parksville? I say it's between Plum Branch and Modoc. Yeah. And then they laugh, and you're like, uh, where okay, is sure. it? Sure. So then I say it's near Augusta. Okay. And so right. everybody's, of course, everybody's heard of Augusta because of the Masters. That's right. So they kind of have an idea. Small town? Is. Oh, yeah, 200 people, if that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I thought I was from a small town, uh, yeah. uh, but no, you've got me beat there. You yeah, went, to, went to Clemson, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. You're a tiger. 
I'm Tiger. I went there and got my undergrad and my master's degree from Clemson and was an equipment manager for the men's basketball team the whole time I was there. How about that? But so, that was fun. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed that. It was a great experience. And um, I actually got to go back a couple of weeks ago to an alumni game. So I yeah. just got to see some old friends. Well, that's basketball. But if I remember right, when I uh, was reading about you a little bit, you're a football official. You yeah. Do that, you I'm do a, that in your spare time. Well, in the fall, that's my hobby. I'm a high school football official. I've been doing it now for 22 seasons. And I've been, uh, I've, you know, kind of fell into it back then and wish I had fallen into it before. <laughs> I just I yeah. enjoy work, uh, working with the kids. Yeah. Being on the field and. Being a tax guy, my friend that kind of introduced me to it said uh, she thought I would enjoy it because it's all about rules. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. So, uh, so I've yeah, I've I've had um, some great experience and made some a lot of new friends um, from the from yeah. just being an official. And it, it, people ask me all the time. It's like, well, you know, do you? You know, you get hollered at or screamed at. I'm like, yeah, I do, but I don't really hear it because I'm in the middle of the field. I'm not. It's not like a basketball game where they're right on top of you. Yeah. Um, so right. it, just, it doesn't really bother me. And it keeps you in shape, I would guess, a little bit. Somewhat. You know, yeah, a little, a little bit. bit. I don't have to run a whole lot. But right. You know. now, I, I think we're close to the same age, and so I know I need something to keep me in shape <laughs> from time to time. And one last thing, I believe you're a deacon at the church. I am. Involved in the AV side of yeah, things so at your church. Yeah, I help out with uh, producing services on Sunday mornings. How about that? Um, so this, again, something I started a while back, and it progressed. I went from this role to this role to this role, yeah, yeah. and that's, this is the role now where I serve as in producing the service. So if something happens to our lights or our mics here, you're our guy. I, I, I don't know about all that, but I can <laughs> I can switch a camera and tell you, okay, this shot looks better than that one. Right, <laughs> right. All right. Well, thanks for uh, taking a minute or two. You ready to talk business? Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk business. Okay, you've been in the you've been doing tax stuff for 35 years, so you know your stuff. Um, and I'm glad you're here because, you know, I started this business and I started this show several months ago, and I've always got questions being a new business owner about things. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so I'm glad you're here because I'm going to pick your, pick your brain okay. uh, a little bit. In advance of the show, we talked about some topics that would probably be good uh, uh, to share with our viewers. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of tee you up a little bit. Sure. And, uh, and we'll run through these. Okay. I want to start with automobile expenses for businesses. All right. And this is important to me because I have been trying to decide uh, for 2023, how to classify my automobile, because you can do it a two, couple different ways. Right? right, right. So, especially when you're a sole proprietor, uh, you're not necessarily in a big company where right. the company buys the trucks and stuff yeah. like that. For you, just got your own personal car. Uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of ways you can deduct those expenses. One is the actual method, where you go out and let's just say you purchased a vehicle, and then you whatever that cost is, then you're going to depreciate that over the useful life of the in, in the IRS's world that's somewhere five to seven years it just depends on the cost mm-hmm. and then you're going to keep up with all the different expenses that you have with that gas oil changes right I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. but I want to insert something right yeah. there so um, if you go that route you can if, if I remember right mm-hmm. you can deduct a certain amount of the value in the very first year right that's a higher right. percentage of the value and then it lessens so is that's that correct. correct yeah that's, and what is that it's called percentage? section well it's called a 179 expense so that in other words depending upon the type of vehicle you purchase it's gross vehicle weight et cetera et cetera you get to take it what they call it an immediate expense right and that's also based on the percentage of business use of that vehicle for the year. So let's say you went out and bought, um, well, I'm just going to use this as an example. Let's say you bought a, a heavy duty truck. Right. And that was weighed more than 6,000 pounds. Right. Then that would be eligible for an immediate expense election, probably up to the expense cost of the truck, but you have to multiply that cost times the business use. So if you drove at 80% for business, 20% for personal, you can only deduct 80% of that cost. Right. So the, you don't have to, if you're a business owner and you have a vehicle that you have classified as a business vehicle, you don't have to use that 100% toward business. You don't. Uh, it's no, probably best that you do to make it simple. Well, to make it simple, in other words, so if you can tell the IRS, yes, I have another vehicle yeah. at my disposal that I use for commuting, personal 
that I only use this car, truck, SUV for business, then yeah, you can write off 100% of everything associated with it. Yep. Now, you still need to keep records, yep. um, keeping up with the mileage and stuff, just to, if you got every God asked about it and said, well, can you show me right. you know, what what you do it to her, then you can, that's, a log is the best thing to do. Yeah. And so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is uh, you don't have to claim the vehicle. If I And correct me if no, I'm wrong. No, it's called the but, uh, standard mileage rate. So, that's right. And, yeah. and so you just submit your mileage and you take, I believe, what is it now? This 68 year, 67 cents 67. for however number of many business miles you have in, right. in the year. And then that's just your straight up vehicle expense deduction. You don't have to keep up with your gas receipts, oil changes, none of that. It's all... All of those expenses are kind of factored into that standard mileage rate. Got it. So a lot of people, just as a uh, ease of record keeping, and they just yeah. take that standard. But again, you still have to make sure you keep up with those miles and what those miles were driven for. Right. Because if you're using a personal car and you're driving it for other things besides business, you need to document that stuff. Yep. Yeah. Got it. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about record retention. Okay. Uh, I worked for business, uh, you know, in the corporate world for a long time, and I know that we kept records and we kept records and kept <laughs> records. But in reality, how long do we have to keep? Well, for tax purposes, and I don't want to get into anything besides that, for tax purposes, the normal statute of limitations is three years. So a taxing authority, we'll just call it the IRS, they have three years to come in and question you up to your last three years of returns. After three years, pretty much they're done other than in a case where if they can prove that you understated your income by more than 25%, then they can go back to years four, five, and six. Mm -hmm. And that would be those in those particular years. Um, barring that, the only time the statute never stops is when you haven't filed a return or the return you filed was fraudulent. Well, of course, you know, hopefully nobody's filing fraudulent returns and you're actually filing returns. So if you're doing all those things, uh, you really only need to keep the records six, but we always kind of recommend seven. Mm -hmm. So keep them seven. After seven, the actual tax documents themselves, you can shred, you know, burn, whatever, however you want to get rid of them or delete. Mm -hmm. And these, in these days, you just go and find that file and delete it off your computer. Right. Now, there's certain documents that you're going to want to keep longer. In other words, like, let's, for instance, if you had a rental property that you were um, that you had purchased and you were renting that, you're going to want to maintain the cost, that settlement statement where you bought it, until you sell it later on. So that might be 10, 15 years down the road. Right. In case they ever, when, when you sold it, they said, well, show us proof of what you paid for it. Yeah. Well, there you go. Switching gears another time. Mm -hmm. Charitable contributions. How, how what level of chair, uh, charitable contributions can you make to a recipient before uh, it is no longer tax deductible? What's the limit? Uh, for charitable contributions, those are, I believe now, it's, it's 60% of your adjusted gross income. So you could... Again, that's if you itemize. So if you're given to a, a charity and you're, you know, you, you got to be pretty charitable to be having that as an issue for yourself uh, on the individual side. Now, corporations, C corporations have a different uh, percentage limitation. Um, it's only like, uh, I think it's 10% of their taxable income. But, uh, but most people, a lot of people these days, unless they're either very charitable well, they have a lot of of uh, debt on their home. They're not I, they're not able to itemize because mm -hmm. the, the standard deduction is so much greater than than it used to be. Now that's going to hold on for another two years, and then we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, right. Uh, so if you make a hundred grand, you can give up sixty grand without that's right. tax implications. Well, that's just that you get is that as a deduction. That's correct. Uh, right, just yeah. making it simple. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a security breach of the uh, State Department of Revenue's records back in 2018, which led to some changes uh, in um, uh, some of the laws. Uh, can you uh, kind of give me an overview of that? Yeah, I'm not, so I'm not familiar. No, well, so obviously, for those of us who have been around a while, they, you you remember that? Oh, and I remember it. For sure. <clears throat> so what they what the what they came in and said, well, you know, it's shameless. So for you had the opportunity to get 
I think it was two years worth of identity protection that was paid for by the state. But after that, that kind of went away. But they also then said, well, we're going to give you the ability to take a deduction on your South Carolina personal return for up to $300 if you're single or 1000 if you file a joint return or your return has dependents. So if, in other words, if it's, say it's a head of household situation, you got a mom or a father who are by themselves and they, they have kids, they can deduct up to $1,000 on their state return for it, that identity theft mm-hmm. protection contract. And that's an annual thing. It gets passed every year, so it's not, a, it's not quite permanent in the law, but they kind of look at it every year and decide whether they want to keep it around or not. Right. The state's 529 plan, I mm-hmm. believe it's called the Future Scholars Program. Right. Right. And they've been on this show before several times as Curtis Loftus, who was the state treasurer for South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, a, a, a huge endorser of the Future Scholar Program. He comes here to talk about it once a year. Can you deduct contributions to the 529 plan? On your South Carolina return, you can't. Okay. So, like, so, for instance, anybody that wanted, so even today, yep. if you wanted to make a contribution to a plan that you've either got already established or you wanted to start one, you could make a contribution today and let it be deductible on your 23 tax return. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Typically, it's a, you're on a, you deduct it when you paid it, but in this case, yeah. you can go back if you tell them this was a prior year contribution. And you have the ability to do that up until April 15th. Yeah, right. Um, and then anybody can establish an account. Uh, it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be the mom or dad of the child that they're looking to put co- through college in, say, five years, 10 years, or 18 years. It can be a grandparent, an aunt, or uncle. It, and they get, they get the deduction on their personal tax return. Not, it's not like, oh, well, I gave it to so-and-so, then somebody yeah. else has to. You get the deduction for it. And so if you, if you think about it, it's a, in 23, it's an immediate 6.4% return on the money right away. Yeah. Because you put it in there, you get the tax deduction. Um, I know of people who kids are in college or, in, say, in private school, they'll make the contribution and then, like a week later, they take it out. Yeah. Well, they didn't leave it in there to make any money per se, yeah. but they got that deduction on the state return. So they, like I said, there's that six point four percent return right. right there. Got it. For something they were already going to spend money on anyway. Exactly. We live in an increasingly echo aware world, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so, for those who want to live green, so to speak, and are interested in in uh, uh, living. Uh, in, in that regard, what kind of tax credits can you get? Well, now, the, so the, I think it was the in, part of the Inflation Reduction Act, they increased the tax credit for certain energy efficient improvements that you can make to your home. Used to be, it was, it was a small credit, it was a lifetime a limit of $500 for, the, for that was it. Once you did that, there was nothing more you could get. Now you can um, purchase Exterior doors, windows, put insulation in, new heat pumps, water heaters. A number, you can even have uh, somebody come in and do a home energy audit of your house. And it will basically let you know, okay, here's the things we found and you could help you know, save money right. here and there. And you can get up to a m- maximum annually, not lifetime, annually of $1,200 mm-hmm. on your federal tax return. Now, there's limits as far as, like, you can only get up to $600 on, say, windows and $250 on a door, which, and, but they might get cap it at two, so you can only get two doors a year. <laughs> right. So you can, y'all want to do these two doors this year and two doors <laughs> next year, and at Home Energy Audit is a $150 credit. Yeah. Solar roof? Yes. Now, that is that is a, that is different from this the, the, what was in the Inflation Reduction Act, but that's a 30% credit. I'm not if I remember correctly, where you can put solar panels on your roof or you know around to generate energy for your house, and then South Carolina also has a credit for that as well. Uh, so you get federal and state on a on say solar panels. Yep. The Corporate Transparency Act. 
Yes. Uh, it was passed a few years ago, but it's really going into effect now, if I Correct. remember mm -hmm. right. Uh, I began looking into it, reading about it, and I realized it was way more convoluted than my brain would allow to understand. So please explain. Well, I'll try my best. It's, of course, again, it, it is something new. And starting this year, if you have a corporation or a limited liability company, you're going to need to um, file information with the Department of Treasury through the FinCEN website, which is uh, Federal Crimes Enforcement, I think, and tell them certain things about the company. And what really it amounts to is you need to let them know who is the person or persons who own 25% or more of this company, either directly or indirectly, or, or and or anyone who has substantial control over this entity. So you may have a partnership where you got 10 people who all own 10%, and you're like, well, I don't have to file it. No, yeah, you do. You have to find somebody who has the authority to make decisions, which probably would be the managing member. Mm -hmm. So then they're going to have to go to that website and send give, give them information about the, the name of the company, the address, the federal ID number, other things, and then you also need to say who who you are, where you live. You're also going to have to upload a copy of either your state state li uh, issued driver's license or your passport. And then this is kind of what they've. The goal of this is is to try to look out for those who are using companies for criminal activity, money laundering, etc. So it's it's more out there as to who's doing what. Yep. And if you had an entity in existence as of 12-31-23, then you have this entire calendar year in order to file this initial report. Yep. If you create an entity this year, then you're going to have to file this initial report within 90 days after the date of the creation. Yep. After, next, after this year, then you're only going to have 30 days. And in any time anything changes with the, what you had is, were submitted to them, you have to file an, um, uh, an amended report. And I mean anything as in your CFO moved down the street. Well, that CFO's address is now different. So you need to go and report it to them. Otherwise, you're subject to penalties. Like I said, convoluted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> John, I'm going to get you out of here. Okay. On on this sure uh for for those who have started a new business who are off on their own and like mm -hmm. i said i fall into that category any uh advice for folks like me yeah i you know and this is i'll say this is more but non-tax piece of advice is that enjoy what you're doing and understand what you feel like you are good at and then hire people that where you are sort of weaker at so that you can do what, like if you're a salesperson, then do your sales. Don't be spending a lot of time trying to deal with numbers and figuring out, well, how do I enter this into this software? You're, you're going to spin your wheels. You're going to get frustrated. And you're just, you're, you're not making the best use of your time. I, f I feel like a lot of startup businesses, the people have great ideas and they know what they want to do, but they find themselves getting bogged down and trying to do too much. Right. And right. so that's what I would say. That is good advice. Folks, that is John Price. John, 35 years of experience uh, in, in tax uh, and tax advice. And so uh, he's with Scott & Company. We appreciate you being here. And uh, thanks for joining us on another episode of Let's Talk Business South Carolina. And thanks again uh, to Greenville Technical College uh, for partnering with us on this episode. See you next time.